my wife and I, we moved from the south of, of Sweden to Stockholm uh, in the beginning of the 90s. And uh, we joined a, a church with roots back in the uh, 1850s. Uh, and a little bit um, more than 10 years ago, uh, our church went through a very visible process of church revitalization, uh, which was very, very exciting. Before I start to say something about revitalization, I, uh, I would like to remind you about uh, a word from Jesus where he's talking about the church. It's a very, uh, uh, it's a very well-known and, and famous uh, world, word, which he is telling his disciples not in Jerusalem, which in, in my eyes is a kind of surprising. He brings his disciples up to uh, Caesarea Philippi, further north. It's a little bit strange place for a huge announcement. Why isn't he bringing his disciples to Jerusalem? That would be a very natural place to ask a question, who do you think I am? And then talk about the church that can never be destroyed. Of course, Jerusalem is very important, and we can see that Jesus is, is doing a lot of things in Jerusalem, but in this occasion, <coughs> he brings his people up to Caesarea Philippi, which was a, an area known for worship of the Greek god Pan, which was the, the god of, of nature and beauty, often associated with music, but also with pleasure and sex. And in this area, they have uh, discovered an open-air sanctuary for the Greek god of Pan, Interesting. And of course, I don't know the explicit reason why Jesus brought his disciples there, but I, I think it's fascinating to imagine Jesus standing in, in this kind of context instead of in Jerusalem. And here he asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. And I int interpret it as a, um, a symbolic act from Jesus that the church will not only be, be, uh, be established in Jerusalem, of course it will, and we, we see in the book of Acts that that is the starting point, but gradually uh, the church that confesses that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, will be established in all places where people at that moment worship gods like Pan. And today we can see all over the world, the, the Christian faith is the most widespread uh, religion, uh, most widespread social phenomenon amongst human beings. So through history, the church has been established at all those different places where people previously worshipped different gods and goddesses, had very different understanding of what it is to be a human being, what it is, what kind of world this is that we are a part of. And then Peter's testimony has uh, been preached and believed and churches have uh, been built. And nothing in the long run uh, will overcome the church of Jesus Christ. Not even secular European culture and not even the powers of, of Hades. Nothing can, uh, can stop the Church of Jesus Christ. And I think we need to have that kind of really encouragement perspective with us when we then are wrestling with this, the church situation in, uh, in Europe. <clears throat> so when we, uh, when we think of revitalization, 
we can immediately we immediately understand that that is such a basic aspect of human life that naturally most aspects of our life uh, become stagnate if we don't have a conscious process of uh, of renewal we can think of relationships we can think of of marriage a marriage that was really passionate at the start with openness and communication and commitment and compassion and then by itself a number of other factors come in and we can become numb to each other uh, there comes in coldness or distance and we don't communicate uh, any longer and we take each other for granted so in in every marriage relationship there needs to be a, a continually renewal uh, of the relationship and of the commitment and of, uh, of the love. And we can see in the New Testament that this theme of renewal is there in, in many, uh, uh, in many uh, areas. We need to be renewed in our minds. Do not conform to the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Naturally, our minds are pattern according to the culture around us. But we need to renew them in, uh, in the pattern of the will of God. We need to be renewed in our relationship with, with the Lord, inwardly renewed, uh, Paul says, day by day. It's a constant process. By confessing Jesus as Lord, we are saved, we are brought from darkness into light. But then there is a, a uh, continued day by day walking with the Lord and the call to be renewed. Paul can talk about his relationship with the uh, brothers and sisters in uh, uh, Philippi. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. So they had, there had been some distance, but they had renewed their relationship with the apostle. And Paul is really thankful for that. Or Colossians. Uh, chapter 3, put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. So we can see this is a, a, a theme uh, through uh, the New Testament. And naturally, that should also be a theme in relationship to the church, to the, the, the local community. Of course, that needs to be renewed. There is the same natural process of... Uh, of things being uh, more frozen, patterns that are not helpful any longer, distances created within the community or between the community and the surrounding culture. So we need uh, to be renewed also as a local church. Of course, as David said, there, we should never put the contrast between church planting and church revitalization. In Europe, both are desperately needed. We have so many churches that need revitalization, and we have so many areas where there are no churches, uh, where we need to plant new churches. So we need to do both thing, things simultaneously. And it will, in many cases, be uh, a matter of the individual calling. What has God called you to do? Plant a new church? Or being part of the renewal of an already existing church? church. When I was thinking then of why uh, church revitalization, because that, that is what we are going to focus on now, I thought of six reasons for why this is important. And uh, I will try to go through them quite quickly, and I hope we can have a, a discussion and, and process some of it at least. Why do we need church revitalization? Well, I've in one sense al already answered it, because all of life is like this. We need to renew things constantly. But more specific, why church revitalization? Reason num number one, we need to honor God's work in history. And that is especially true in Europe with this rich, long history of the church. In some places, the Christian church have been here for 2,000 years. In my country, uh, the two German monks, Ansgar and Wittmer, they came during the 9th century 
uh, was sent by the Bishop of Bremen to go up to the Vikings. Scary, <laughs> scary mission. And they came up to what is now Stockholm and preached the gospel and established the church. And then for more than a thousand years, the gospel has been also up far in the, uh, in the Nordic uh, countries. And it would be very strange if we just dismiss what God has been building during centuries and, and more than a millennia. Of course, we need to take care of that and give it uh, a new flourishing. Uh, it's, it's important not to discard what God previously have done and where faithful brothers and sisters have invested and sacrificed to build up. And we have a calling to honor uh, that. We should not dismiss uh, uh, history. And all over Europe, we, we see the traces of, of God's hand in history. And we should be uh, thankful and, um, uh, and honor that. Uh, of course, there are situations where churches are dying out. I can see in my, my country, because of urbanization, uh, Sweden is the country in Europe with the fastest urbanization. People are moving from the countryside into the, the cities. And of course, there will be churches that put, there are not people around in the area any longer. Uh, so uh, we need to take that kind of... Uh, of facts um, uh, seriously. Okay, first, we need to honor God's work in history. Secondly, we need church revitalization because of the changing focus that happens in most churches. When churches start, the focus is very often naturally an outward looking. Uh, perspective. The focus is winning people for the kingdom, establishing a church and having a witness for the gospel. But there is a natural tendency when the church then grows that gradually there becomes a more inward looking focus on maintaining what has been built up. Uh, and looking for the needs of those who are part of the church, very important, of course, but uh, the focus of reaching new people gradually is um, diminishing. And there comes in a kind of mentality of, this is the way we always have done it, let's continue to do it. <laughs> we seem to have a kind of conservative dimension to our, uh, our beings, especially as we grow older, that is a natural tendency to repeat what we did uh, before. Uh, so here is a, a very important aspect that in the church we need to return to our, to our core identity as, um, as a church of, of Jesus Christ, who has called us to uh, make disciples. From, from all people. We cannot be only inward looking, we need to have also an outward looking uh, focus. So we need to have a constant process of reminding ourselves what is a church and what are we called to do as a church and to see if what we currently are doing actually fits the biblical answers to this, what is a church and what are we called to do as a church? Thirdly, we need church revitalization because not only because things have changed within the church, but because the culture around the church is changing. And if we look at the 20th century, it is one of the most dramatic centuries for Europe in terms of worldview, in terms of understanding and thinking, that we have totally changed as a culture our understanding of uh, this world and of ourselves. I often refer back to Acts chapter 17, that's the favorite chapter of, uh, of every apologist. 
Usually we go to directly to Acts, uh, to uh, the second part of the chapter where Paul is, um, uh, is in Athens. But it's very interesting if you read the beginning of the chapter, well, when Paul in is in the synagogue in Thessaloniki. In the synagogue, he's, he has the possibility, three Sabbaths in a row, to teach. And he reasoned with the people in the synagogue, explaining and proving that Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. And this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you, he says, is the Messiah. And some of the Jews were persuaded, and so were many of uh, the God-fearing Greeks and quite a few of the prominent women. He was explaining and proving out from scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. Or more correctly, he was explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and be raised from the dead. And then he said, that is just what has happened with Jesus. So he is the Messiah who fits the description of the Old Testament. In that setting, his audience already believe in the creator God of Israel. They already believe in scripture. They already believe in the promises of scripture, but they have misunderstood those promises or not seen the, the really big picture. They were not expecting a suffering Messiah. They were expecting a, a victorious Messiah. And therefore they had difficulties in accepting Jesus. And therefore, Paul had to wrestle with them with scripture, showing, yeah, Messiah is going to be victorious, but first, haven't you read? First, he must suffer and be raised from the dead. Now, 100, 150 years ago in Europe, we were very much in a synagogue culture. I can think of my country. People believed in God. They had respect for scripture. They knew the basic outline of scripture, even though they have misunderstanding at a number of places. And you could, when you were building a church and you were preaching, you could go directly on the gospel and challenge people not only to have a, a, a general acceptance, okay, there is a creator God, but actually to repent from your sins and come into a living relationship with God. Now, when we, go, when we follow Paul to Athens, he is in a totally different context. The people there did not believe in, in a creator God. They were polytheists, believing those many gods, including Pan. Or they were philosophers. And two groups are mentioned, the Epicureans and the Stoics. The Stoics were pantheists, thinking God and the universe is the same, an impersonal spiritual reality. The Epicureans were deists. Practically, they were atheists, saying, we do not need to care about the gods, because they have withdrawn, and we will never be confronted by them. We live now, and then we die, and it's, it's over. When Paul is talking to them, his approach is totally different. So he's not quoting scriptures. Of course, his message is, is uh, there are echoes of, from scriptures uh, all over it. But he's not quoting scriptures, but they're poets, Greek poets. And he is deconstructing their worldview, showing uh, the foolishness of polytheism or pantheism or what the Epicureans were believing about the gods withdraw withdrawing. Now they are close to us. Uh, so, Paul had a very different approach. Here, I think, too many churches in Europe today have missed what has happened in our culture. We are not in Thessaloniki. We are in Athens. And we need to understand this new culture, uh, which we now are a part of. The secular culture, a pluralistic culture, a very individualistic culture, and that is, of course, the, the point with that, with, uh, th that uh, image, where people 
are not so much wrestling with question about ultimate truth, but people are so focused on the uh, subjective questions of who am I? What is my identity? What makes me unique? How can I be affirmed? Uh, a very different set of questions compared to at the Reformation and the centuries following from that, where people were wrestling with questions like, how can I find a merciful God? Very few young Swedes are wrestling with, on, on an obvious level with, with, with that question. How can I find a merciful God? They are wrestling with their own identity. So here we need to uh, really see how the culture have changed if we want to relate to that culture. And the younger generation in, in our churches, they are of course affected enormously by the, the change in our culture. This means that we cannot just repeat uh, previous preaching. So much of the previous preaching in our churches come from an understanding that Europe is in the synagogue situation, is in, the, is in Thessaloniki. Now, if we want to preach today, we need to do what Paul did and preach from an Areopagos uh, perspective. And here I think it's one crucial element, and this uh, wouldn't surprise you since you know I'm an apologist, is that apologetics needs to be part of a, a church today. That's not the only solution to all the challenges we have, absolutely not, but it's, it's one important aspect. Uh, we need apologetics in the sense of explaining the Christian faith in relationship to our culture, like Paul explained the gospel in relationship to the Jewish people who have, have misunderstood scriptures, and how he explained the, the concept of a creator, personal creator God, for all those confused people in, in Athens who had very different concepts of, uh, of God. So the changing culture is an obvious reason why we need to revitalize our church and our understanding of what we are doing inside the church. Fourthly, we have changing uh, demographics inside and outside the church. That goes for an, uh, uh, on a number of levels. There are uh, changes in terms of uh, ages. Most European populations are becoming older with fewer young people, uh, which makes it difficult for young people to connect to the church because it's not their age group. Now, that's a big challenge. What do we do with that? We have, in a number of countries now, uh, very fast changes in terms of ethnicity. My country was, 50 years ago, a very homogeneous country in terms of ethnicity and cultures and language. Now we are extremely pluralistic. This is a huge change. How do you build a church in that new kind of environment where not everyone is a native white Swedish speaking person, uh, but a huge group now have very different background. And there are differences in terms of education. More and more young people going to universities, uh, which are shaping their way of thinking and seeing things. We need to take that into account. Just after the World War, 6% uh, of the young people in Sweden went to universities. Now it's over 50%. Huge change. To be an academic, 1945, was an odd thing, very few. To be an academic today is for a lot of people the normal. That makes a big difference. 
And there are, we need to think about the social classes, social distinctions. Um, fifthly, and, and this is maybe the most obvious, they are changing cultural forms. Organ music is not trendy amongst young people. We have the whole digital world that is shaping uh, the way people, uh, people are approaching the world and are understanding so much, many things and are, how people are relating to each other. Here we need to do some good thinking. What does this mean for us as a church? We all know how, how touchy is, it is with music, but there is no way around <laughs> working very well through the issues of music. How? Because music is such an important part of our culture. How do we deal with music in a constructive way in the church? For young people, socially, how do we hang out with each other in a digital world? Here's a lot of strange things that we who are in an older generation uh, have difficulties to, to grasp how the younger generation is relating uh, to each other. So if the cultural forms around us changes, we need to think through how can we be vitalized in the church in this environment. Of course, there will be things that we do not want to come into the church because everything that is happening around us is not positive. But there is, will also be things that could be really helpful for us in the church. And finally, because the culture around us are changing the learning style, we need to think through how we teach. Not that, not that many uh, generations ago, uh, authority was a very natural concept. So teachers had authorities, parents had authority, pastors and Christian leaders and preachers, they had an authority, and you can act out from that authority. Now, it's a fact that that is undermined. And we can think that is a bad thing, and I, I, in, in a number of respects, I think it is a bad thing. There are also some positive things to it, but, but it is a fact now that young people uh, are functioning differently in this area. Just because you are a pastor and stand on a platform is no reason for them to accept what you are saying. <laughs> So then we need to think through how we can communicate the gospel. And here we need to think through what kind of learning process do we have at the church? What, what place of dialogue? How open are we for, for questions? And making an environment of, of openness that people uh, can share their own thinking. Uh, here I think it's, um, we, we have some, uh, uh, some hard work in front of us to think through the, uh, this. Of course, there will be a proclamation on Sunday in, in, uh, in the service, but we need to think through uh, also other aspects of, of communication. And we need to think through the proclamation that it is accompanied with what Paul did in Thessalonica. He explained and proved, and then he proclaimed that Jesus is the Messiah. So we need also to explain and prove our message before we can proclaim it. All this, I see my, my time is, uh, uh, is running away. All this, of course, needs to be, be within or built upon the, the authority of, of Scripture. And my, uh, my, favorite, uh, my favorite quote these days comes from uh, the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard. As an apologist, I also have some, uh, uh, some criticism of some of, of Kierkegaard's thinking, but he has also many valuable things to say. In an essay called Of the Difference Between a Genius and an Apostle, he says this, if, quote, an apostle becomes neither more nor less than a genius, and then, good night, Christianity. And the point he's making is, if we look 
at the apostle just as a, a human genius and nothing more. So not the a person inspired by God's spirit, then it's good night Christianity. Uh, so that was Kierkegaard's way of, of saying it's absolutely essential that we build upon uh, the teaching of the prophets and the apostles of, of uh, the biblical revelation uh, that we have. Otherwise, it's good night Christianity. But with church re uh, revitalization, we hope it will be good morning Christianity for, for Europe. That is what we uh, pray for and will work for.